Hi, ANSYS lover. This is part two of our course in neural networks. Okay, if you didn't watch part one, why don't you go ahead and watch it first and then come back? It will help you to understand this video much better. Let me recap very quickly what we've already learned in part one. In our last course in neural networks, we learned that a single layer perceptron is a basic component of neural networks. It uses the heavy side step function as the activation function to convert the resulting value to either 0 or 1, thus classifying the input values as 0 or 1. The heavy side step function is particularly useful in classification tasks, in cases where the input data is linearly separable. However, the main goal of our neural network is to find a classifier that works well in non-linearly separable data. Okay, to work with non-linearly separable data, the single layer perceptron and the heaviside step function are useless. We need to have multiple layers that consist of several perceptrons along with a non-linear activation function. In addition, the neural network's weights and biases need to be updated at each iteration so that the model can produce a prediction as close as possible to the real value. Having a function that can only generate either 0 or 1, or yes and no, won't help us to achieve this objective easily. For all these reasons, we need a multi-layer perceptron with a more complex activation function. So, in this video, I'm going to present some interesting activation functions and discuss how the multi-layer perceptron works. Okay, first, what is the goal of the activation function? As we've already seen, the activation function is one of the most important components in the neural network. In particular, it is essential at least for the following reasons. It helps the neuron to learn and make predictions. It introduces nonlinear properties to our network. Let's explore several nonlinear activation functions that are generally used for neural network projects. The first one is the sigmoid function. The sigmoid function generates between 0 and 1. As you can see, it is like the smoothed out version of the heavy side step function. It's a nonlinear function, and we can easily use it as a probability value. The sigmoid activation function is useful for classification problems, but its drawback is, as you can see from the mathematical formula, we need to compute the exponential, which oftentimes is computationally inefficient. Another activation function is the tan function. Tan, or hyperbolic tangent, is very similar to the sigmoid function. It will generate an output value between minus 1 and 1. The tan activation function is nonlinear and has characteristics similar to the sigmoid function. Tan is time-consuming, as you can see from the mathematical formula. The last activation function that I'll present here is ReLU, rectified linear unit. The ReLU will generate zero if the input is less than zero. Otherwise, the output will be the same as the input. So, mathematically speaking, this is the form of the ReLU function. ReLU of z equals max between zero and z. The ReLU is computationally efficient. Okay, now let me explain how the multi-layer perceptrons work. In this figure, you can see an example of the multi-layer perceptron, or MLP. As its name implies, in MLP, we simply stacked multiple perceptrons into several layers. If you look very carefully at it, you will see that MLP is the combination of single-layer perceptrons. Each multi-layer perceptron has three layers, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. The hidden layers simply mean neither an input nor an output layer. Now, as you might guess, the term deep learning solely implies we have more hidden layers. The more layers we have, the more deeply we learn, and the more complex model we develop. Convolutional Neural Networks, CNNs, so useful for image processing and computer vision, as well as recurrent neural networks, deep networks, and deep belief systems are all examples of multi-layer neural networks. 
CNNs can have dozens of layers that work sequentially on an image. Let's take the following example and explain how MLP works. Okay, in general, a neural network generates a prediction after passing all the inputs through all the layers up to the output layer. This process is called feed forward. So looking at this figure, we feed the network with the input x1 and x2, compute the activation function, and then pass it through layer by layer until it reaches the output layer. Suppose that this is a classification task. So the input goes through a sigmoid activation function to the output. Therefore, the output is a probability value between 0 and 1. So if the output value is less than 0 0.5, we can say that the prediction of y is 0. And if it is more than 0 0.5, the prediction value of y is 1. The value generated by the output layer here is 0 0.24, and since this value is less than 0 0.5, we can then say that y hat, a prediction of y, is 0. Then, we'll have a cost function which measures how accurately our model approximated the real label. The cost function is j. So j is equal to the squared sum of the difference between y and the estimated value of y equals y hat divided by 2 times n. N is the number of observations in our data. Training in neural networks simply means minimize this cost as much as possible. Minimizing this cost is finding some combination of weight, W, and bias, B, that could make our cost, J, as small as possible. How can we minimize this cost function? Well, that's an interesting question. So in practice, it used two important algorithms, gradient descent and backpropagation, to minimize the cost function. Those of you who have been doing machine learning might already know about the gradient descent algorithm. Gradient descent is used only to train a neural network in machine learning. To give a better idea, let's assume that our cost function is a convex function like this. As you can see in the diagram above, the horizontal axes represent our space of parameters, weights, and biases, while the cost function, j, is then above the horizontal axes. The red circle depicted in the diagram is the original value of our cost of the weights and bias. In practice, it is randomly given. So to minimize the cost, we now know that we have to go on the steepest path down the bowl. But how do we know which direction to take? Should we increase or decrease the value of our parameters? We can do a random search, but it will take quite a long time and obviously be computationally expensive. There is a better way to find which direction we should go in tweaking the learnable parameters, weights, and biases. Calculus teaches us that the direction of the gradient vector at a given point will naturally point in the steepest direction. Therefore, we'll use the gradient of our cost function. Now, let's simplify things a bit by just looking at the cost of the weights. You can think of the black circle above as our original cost. So recall that the gradient of a function or a variable can be positive, zero, or negative. A negative gradient means that the line slopes downwards and vice versa if it is positive. Remember, our objective is to minimize the cost. We then need to move our weights in the opposite direction of the gradient of the cost function. This update procedure can be written as w equals w minus alpha x, variation or derivative of j, divided by the variation or the derivative of w, where alpha is a step size called the learning rate. So, what is alpha used for? Well, the gradient tells us the direction in which the function has the steepest rate. However, it does not tell us how far along this direction we should step. Alpha basically controls the size of our step. How much should we move towards a certain direction? Choosing the right value for our learning rate is very important, since it will hugely affect two things. The speed of the learning algorithm, and whether we can find the local optimum or not. 
A reasonable learning rate depends on the shape of the cost function. In practice, you might want to use an adaptive learning rate algorithm. We have several adaptive learning rates, such as momentum or RMS prop. Back propagation. The gradient descent algorithm is an optimization algorithm that we use as the learning algorithm in a neural network. So recall that using gradient descent means that we need to find the gradient of our cost function for our learnable parameters, weights, and biases. In other words, we need to compute the partial derivative of our cost function with respect to weights and biases. However, if we observe our cost function j, there isn't a direct relationship between j and both weights and bias. Only if we trace back from the output layer, the layer that generates y hat, we'll see that j, the cost function, has an indirect relation with both weights and bias. You can see that to find the gradient of our cost, we need to find the partial derivative of the cost with all the variables, such as a, the activation function, and z, the linear computation, weight times x plus bias, in the preceding layers. Now this is where we need a backpropagation. Backpropagation is basically a repeated application of the chain rule of calculus for partial derivatives, which I would say is probably the most efficient way to find the gradient of our cost j with all the learnable parameters in a neural network. Okay, that's it for our second introductory video in neural networks. In our next video in neural networks, we'll learn the convolutional neural network. So if you enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe to our channel, and click on the notification button so you can receive a notification when our next course is ready.